Let, let me explain this first. So uh, what happened was, is Thursday, uh, the Thursday night I had preached in Lexington at homecoming, that next, no, wasn't it? Was it the week before? Week before. Week before that Thursday night, I had a dream. Now, I've had a lot of dreams from God, but this one was different. And uh, I've had even one dream where Jesus took me up almost to heaven and showed me great things to happen, and I was emotionally so greatly moved by that dream back, that's been 30 years ago. But this one, I couldn't even tell the dream without choking up. And I don't know what all is going to happen this morning when after I had it, I came to church and I shared it with Pastor Rebecca, Pastor Nancy, of course, Patty heard it before that. And uh, we were talking about interpretations. But Sunday, so it's been two and a half weeks ago, the Sunday I was sharing it with them, it was the next Sunday, wasn't it? We were in praise and worship, and the interpretation dropped in me. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a roundtable today. I'm going to ask Pastor Nancy and Pastor Rebecca to come up with me here shortly. I'm going to read through the dream and tell you what I believe it means for us and uh, what it means for the church. And so, again, it's going to be different this morning, but I'm believing God's going to move on it. I have no idea what, how it's going to end up. But I do believe God's going to move on this this morning. So you ready for this? All right. No. Close. <laughs> Too far. Well, my pogo stick practice has come into handy, huh? <laughs> Is that what that was? <laughs> You can be turning your Bibles to Genesis chapter 46. I'm going to start with Scripture. I always like to go to the Word first in most cases because it's our foundation, right? Without the Word, we have nothing. And the reason I want Pastor Nancy and Pastor Rebecca up here, Pastor Rebecca's come up, coming up in a few minutes once she gets some things put in order, is they help me interpret this. In fact, Pastor Rebecca woke up one morning crying. God moved in on her through the same dream. Genesis chapter 46 verse 1 says, And Israel took his journey. Now Israel is talking about Jacob, right? The son of, uh, the son of Isaac. And uh, he took his journey and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices unto God of his father Isaac. And God spake unto Israel in the visions of the night and said, Jacob... Jacob, and he said, here am I. So Jacob has this dream from God. Now we're on a series in here on spiritual vision. Again, this was declared the year of 2020, the year of perfect vision, although I don't think very many saw what was coming this year, amen? Not in fullness. But yet what God showed me is it's a, it's a year we've got to see in the Spirit, I mean, if we're going to navigate the waters that are, that are here right now, we've got to see with the eyes of God. We've got to be able to see what God is showing us and what he's going to do. Because right now, if you, if you don't have a connection with God, you'll entertain the fear and the hate and even the coming greed that the world's uh, experiencing and that the devil's trying to propagate. But we've got to hear and see with God's eyes and know what he's going to do to keep our joy. Otherwise, you'll get mad. And as I mentioned here, if, you know, more than once, the enemy is trying to fill the second heaven, the soul realm, with anger, frustration, revenge, indignance, to get the people of God reacting to his impartations versus what the Word says. We don't look at the things which are seen, but the things which are unseen, Right? So we keep our focus on what the Word says, what God's prophesied. And he said he's coming back for a glorious bride, a glorious church. And we are of that church, right? Those that will press into God in the end times that really have a relationship with Jesus, we're of that bride. And so he's going to bring forth a move. The Spirit, it says in Isaiah 60, Arise and shine, for the light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. 
For darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness of people, but his glory shall be seen upon thee. And then it says, and your sons and daughters shall come from far. That during a time of great darkness on the earth, God's going to bring forth the glory. But if you can't comprehend, and you don't have your eyes on that promise of glory, you'll start to react to what you see in the world. And then you become captive to that arena of thought. So we've got to make sure we keep our eyes on the prize. And one of the ways that God speaks to us is through dreams, spiritual vision. Now, I had planned today to do a whole teaching with the chalkboard of different types of spiritual vision. Visions, open, closed, dreams, trances, visitations, a whole list. But instead, we're going to focus on this one dream today and hopefully next Sunday, uh, unless God intervenes get back to the teaching on the spiritual vision. Now, I want to read through this dream. It's interesting. Uh, we had all-night prayer Friday night. I got maybe four, four and a half hours sleep because I stayed here. Went back, worked all day out in the sun. And about, oh, I don't know, midnight, 11.30 last night, I, was got, I got tired. I said, I'm going to bed, which is early for me. And I went up and sat in my recliner, and I think I dozed off maybe 15 minutes and woke up wide awake. I mean, just wide awake. And I know it was to, I was to write down this dream. Now, I'd had a plan because I don't like typing these things out. I'd rather speak it. And Carol was going to transcribe what I said today. Carol, you're off the hook. I was up for two hours last night writing this down. In fact, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't get sleepy again until about 5 in the morning. So uh, I've been up all night, and uh, but feel great. God's good, right? So here's the dream. Uh, it starts off, two men are discussing a house that has to be condemned. The house is very dilapidated. In fact, you can put up the picture now. This is not the house, but it's very similar to what I saw in the dream. It was a totally run-down house, and it was on a 10-acre lot. And... Uh, there was no paint on the building. You can see through the walls in places. This is not the exact floor plan, but it's about the same size. In fact, on the one I saw, the entryway was on the side over to this right side instead of on the front. And uh, they're talking about that they've been assigned to tear down this house. It's been condemned. And uh, the man in charge of the company, I knew he was the number one guy. He was the head of honcho was supposed to sign off on the plans. There was a blueprint. He was supposed to sign off on it. And he's standing next. He's standing up, and next to him is seated a guy at a table who I knew was his right-hand man. It was his associate assistant, second in charge, whatever. Uh, he, was, he was his boots-on-the-ground type guy. The other guy was like the CEO. And the guy with the plans in charge says, I don't know what's going on, but I just don't feel like I can sign off on these. And he says, I want you to do it. So he hands the plans to the next guy sitting there. And the man sitting down spreads out the plans. And he's got a stamp, like a seal. I have an engineering seal that uh, he was about to stamp the plans with it. He was validating that the, the demolition could, con could commence. And he's about to stamp it. And he goes, I can't. I just feel like I can't do this. And he turns to the guy in charge and he says, I'm going to buy it. I'm going to fix it up. I'm going to restore it. I just can't tear down this house. And uh, in the dream, I then become aware I'm the second guy. I'm the guy with a seal that says, I can't tear it down. I'm going to restore it. And it occurred to me, I made the decision, I was going to restore it for my wife, Patty. Amen? I was going to make this a dream home for Patty. Now I'm looking at this house, and I'm thinking, but Patty's not going to like this. <laughs> she's not going to see that. I knew in the dream, she is not going to like this house. And she's not going to like the plans. She's going to think I'm crazy, but i got to show it to her. And I'd already made the decision to buy it, so I, you know, it's, it's, I purchased it. And I take, I call Patty. She comes to look at the house. She looks at it, and I tell her what I'm going to do. She says, I love it. 
And I was like, are you kidding me? And so I take her in the house, and it's tiny. I'm talking about maybe three rooms. But as we come in that side door in, you know, to the right, to the right of that is a small room. And she says, we can transform this room into my rec room. I don't even know what a rec room is, but in the dream, she said a rec room, R-E-C, recreation. So I guess a party room or whatever. I can transform this into my rec room. I said, okay. Well, all of a sudden, now the dream shifts to sometime later. And out the back, on the opposite side of the house, I'm building a deck. And I've got the deck up, and I'm putting up the rails with the spindles, you know, the balusters or whatever around it, little two-by-twos. And uh, it's not very high off the ground. You can see the, ha the house is one story. The deck's only maybe a couple feet high. And the no neighbors, next-door neighbors to the house, our 10-acre lot, just showed up. And it's this couple, I don't know, 40-ish, with, with a, a bunch of kids. I don't know how many. I didn't count them. Three, four, ten. I don't know there was these kids. But there's one boy about... 10 years old, 8 or 10 years old, climbing up back of the deck by grabbing onto these spindles. And I says, wait a minute. And I told everybody, I said, wait a minute. I've got to make sure this deck is built right. Uh, I don't want him to pull this off and fall backwards and hurt himself, something to that effect. And I said, I've got to make sure I put at least two nails in every spindle at the top and bottom versus just one, which is what a lot of people do. In a dream, that's what I was thinking. And uh, so I bend down, and I'm looking right here. I can still see the image, looking at these spindles. And there were two nails, one above the other, put into each spindle. And I knew I'd built it right. Now, this is what's interesting. I've built a lot of decks. I put in a lot of spindles. And I always use screws, never nails. But in this case, there were nails. And I, and I stood up, and I told them, I said, it's okay, this thing is built perfect. It's perfectly to specifications. It's exactly as it needs to be. It will hold up. And all of a sudden, the dream shifted again. Now it's years later. And uh, I'm dead. In the dream, I know that I've passed away, but yet I'm watching things. And I'm floating or traveling, I don't know if it's in a vehicle, but I'm traveling down a street. What used to be a 10-acre lot is now in like a spread-out subdivision. And there's houses all around the house I built for Patty. And uh, as I'm approaching the house, I knew in the dream, it just was about divine download, this house was famous. It was known all around. Everybody knew about this house. It was like a landmark house. That it, was the, that it was a house that was built by a man out of love for his wife, out of extreme love. That he built her dream house and put his life into it uh, to make this thing as she wanted it. And so I'm coming up on the house, and, and that was the overwhelming emotion. Was just It was a love story. And the whole thing was about the love of me for, for Patty which you guys know is, know is extreme, right? Even when she treats me bad and ridicules me when I'm preaching. Just threw that part in. That wasn't in the dream. Yeah, you need another haircut. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We won't go there. So, <laughs> so I'm coming up on the house... That's where I was before I was rudely interrupted <laughs> again. And I see the house, and the house is maybe two stories, three at the most high, but it's spread out huge. And it just looks like a just an enormous, you know, I'd say maybe 10,000 square feet, uh, maybe 20. It's like a giant ranch spread out. But it didn't have any like fancy columns, no fancy adornments, no fountains, anything. It was just a, this spread out big house. And the house really looked kind of plain. It was a, wasn't exactly a box, but it was boxes with some you know, extensions off of it. But what was unusual, what was totally, I've never seen anything like it, 
was the roof. I would have drawn a picture of the roof to show you, but I don't think I could draw it. It was a roof that was uh, made out of sh giant shingles. Maybe, you know, three feet by four feet or so. The shingles were laid out all over the roof, but the end of each shingle curved way up, almost like a ski jump. And it curved way up. Uh, like you see sometimes in the Chinese buildings or whatever this and it was covered all shingles like that and I thought I've never seen a roof like that in my life and uh, but I'm watching the house and it's just huge but outwardly doesn't look like anything that dressy that showy and all of a sudden I switch to another scene are y'all still with me am I boring you so far I am on another scene and in this scene I don't know if it's the same two guys originally, but it's two guys in the exact same position having the exact same discussion. And the guy in charge, the CEO, says, we have been commanded by the government to tear down this house. And he says, I've got to sign off on these plans to authorize its destruction. It's been condemned. And uh, he's got it. He goes, but I can't do it. I can't sign off it. So he, so good, so he gives it to the the guy second in charge, which this time wasn't me. At least I didn't have that revelation. The guy second in charge. Well, I don't know if it was or not. And he grabs it, spreads it out. He's about to stamp it. He says, I can't do it. I'm going to buy it. And the guy in charge says, it's been condemned. It's been condemned because there's oil all in the soil. It was like there had been a big oil spill all around, and oil had gotten into the ground. And because the ground was contaminated, they wanted the whole area destroyed and, you know, dug up or whatever. He says, you can't. It's been condemned because of the oil. And the second guy in charge says, I will get that oil out of the ground. I will restore it. I've got to save this house. And uh, he says to the guy in charge, he says, have you ever seen the inside of this house? And the guy in charge says, no, I haven't. He says, let me give you a tour of this house. So we go into the same door position. I'm following them. As uh, was originally there. Did you guys ever see The Wizard of Oz? I remember when I was young, we would watch The Wizard of Oz. It was always on a black and white television. And then finally, we got the first color TV in our neighborhood, Huntsville, Alabama. And we had people coming over to watch The Wizard of Oz. And it starts off in black and white again. At least it was sepia tone. I thought, we thought it was in color. Where's the color? And we watch all the way till the tornado picks up the house and it lands it in Oz. And when she goes out the door, boom, explosion of color. Remember this? Follow the yellow brick road. Anyway. <laughs> An explosion of vivid colors. And when we went through that door, that happened in the dream. The dream went from a place where I don't know if it's in color or not. Everything seemed kind of drab. Oh, I left off a part of the dream originally. I got to back up because I'm telling it instead of reading it. When I took Patty in the house, she says, we can make this the rec room. To the left of the main hall, or little opening foyer, there was a trap door in the floor. Kind of like you would see if you ever ever seen houses, old house that had a cellar, and you lift up the trap door in the floor and there'd be steps going down. There was that. And I look, and, and it doesn't look like it's more than four foot high down there, but it goes down to like a dirt floor under the house. And I lift the door and I says, great, I can make this into my shop. Like, what am I going to do, bend over and just store <laughs> stuff in there? I don't know. It didn't make sense. And then we go out of the house. And I'm looking, I'm standing in front like this porch here. And see where the wood's all fallen off on the right side here? There was a door. And I knew the door went to that, like, crawl space area. And I says, great, I can, and it was a big door. I can use that door and move all my shop tools through that. I don't have to carry them through the house and try to get them through the floor. So I don't know what part that plays in the dream, but it was a, it was a, it was, it, it was a section of it. So now we go through this door. He's showing the head guy the now re restored house. 
And when we go through the door, an explosion of color, an explosion of luxury. You couldn't tell it from the outside of the house, but inside, everything was made of gold and silver, shining chandeliers all through the house. And you, I mean, you're looking, this thing is phenomenal. And he says, here's what the inside looks like. And he says to the head guy, he says, let me show you the rec room he built for his wife. So originally, remember Patty said to the right, she would have, we go through a, a, a doorway, wasn't a door on it, just an opening, to the right, and there's a rec room. In fact, it's basically, as far as I can see, a series of rooms that were luxuriously decorated. And there are people everywhere. The house is packed with people celebrating. I mean, they're having a glorious time. There's laughter and joy. And uh, the house wasn't really brightly lit, but it was done in a formal way that it was just luxurious. And in fact, as we're starting to go through the different rooms of the rec room, and about the second or third room, to the right, there's one corner they had built a little stage, maybe only a foot high. But there's a band playing live music in the house. What's that? Amen. And, and just a great time of a celebration. Let me see where I'm at now. And they remark they would have never have guessed what was on the inside of the house based on what they saw on the outside. And then I woke up. I woke up in tears. Not from being upset from the emotion of this love story, of what was built on behalf of this, of, of building for my wife, how much I loved her, and how moving it was. And when I woke up, uh, Patty was standing next to my bed. She'd brought some clothes upstairs and, and uh, uh, was dropping them off in my room. She don't care if she wakes me up, it doesn't matter. But, uh, <laughs> there she was. And so I said, I've got to tell you this dream. So we went down, I told her the dream. I said, it was a love story of this man renovating a house for his wife. She says, well, good. That means you can get me the new carpet. <laughs> so I called Kevin Holler and we ordered new carpet. Praise God. And what do you do when you get a dream like that? So I, I pondered, what does this mean? I called these two in. You know, I'm getting some interpretation of it. Uh, but I wasn't getting really the fullness until a week ago. Was it a week ago or two weeks ago? Two weeks ago. In Sunday morning service, I'm worshiping God, and boom, I had a download. And here's the gist of it, and I've called these two up here because she got some interpretation, but Pastor Rebecca, she had a heavenly download <coughs> based off of it. And I want them to join in in, in talking about it. where the two men are standing out in front of the house, one, the one standing up is Father God. The one sitting down is Jesus. And the house is the church. It's God's people. And where all of a sudden they say, you know, it looks shot. We ought to start over, just raise it to the ground. They said, no, we can restore it. And where all of a sudden I'm playing the part of Jesus, it really wasn't about me. And where Patty is one I'm building for, it was, it was really a representation of Jesus and the bride of Christ. And it was a love story about how much Jesus loves the church and how he was willing. Remember that he says, I'll purchase it. And in the next scene, I'm dead? Well, this really bothered me. I mean, when I had the dream, I'm going, am I about to die? You know, I really didn't feel that way, but why would I have such a dream where I'm dead in the dream? Do I have to turn the church over to somebody else? They're going to continue the work I'm doing? Is it my time? What's going on here? And then the Lord said, no, it was Jesus that died on behalf of the bride. And he died this house so this house could be built. He put himself into it. 
And when you saw the family come over, that's, that's the harvest being drawn to the construction. And that you saw the nails and it was built right, perfectly to plan. Uh, as a representation, God's going to finish work and it's going to be done perfectly according to his plans. Every prophetic word that God's brought forth and declared about the church is going to come to pass. There's blueprints that tell how it's got to be done that are going to describe exactly what God's going to finish, and we have it in the Word. And so uh, it was all about a love story of Jesus and the church. And understand, he had to present it to the bride. I had to present it to Patty to see if they would agree to it. And looking at the process or the project, many people would say, not me. I'm not giving up my lifestyle. I'm not giving up the home I live in now. I'm not giving up the, the, the surroundings I have now for this piece of junk and for this calling of you. I can't drink. I can't smoke. I can't party. I can't do the things I used to do. But yet Patty, when she saw it, said, yes, I see it. The people that are going into God's construction process must see the vision. They must see beyond the current circumstances and see what God has prophesied about their future and about the future of the house of God and the people of God. And she saw it. She went in making plans. Here's what we can do. Here's what we can do there. And God wants to fulfill. See, when you sell out to him, he will give you the desires of your heart. It may seem hopeless. There may be a time of waiting, a time of nothing happening, a time you still feel condemned. But yet God has a plan to bring to you everything you ever desired. Now, later, uh, when I'm coming up the road uh, and I see this house and it doesn't look that phenomenal on the outside, know that people look at our churches and think, that doesn't look so great. Our church is bigger than that. Our church is fancier than that. They don't have any stained glass except that behind the pulpit. I mean, we, they don't have a steeple. They're in a storefront. This can't be God. And they're judging the church based on what they see on the outside versus what God's doing on the inside. Now, no, we are the houses of God. We are the church of the living God. And maybe people will look at your life and say, I don't see anything great. You know, they're still fighting battles. They've still got challenges. They're not wealthy. They're not, you know, don't look to me like they're overcoming that much, but God's doing construction on the inside. A luxurious, no holds barred renovation on each of us on the inside to get us ready to house his glory, to make of us a, a, an example of his love story. So when I'm coming down the road and I see the house, it looks plain on the outside. That's what people look at us today and think, what's so great about that? And not know what God's already sown into the inside of us by the word and built within us, that you know no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Now, I love this. Isaiah 54, 17. What's that? Is it really? No weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue that rises up against you in condemnation. Remember they wanted to condemn the house? Every, isn't it amazing God started with that? Every tongue that rises up against you in condemnation, you will condemn it. Or he says, I will condemn it. For this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. See, we have to deal with that condemnation or else the enemy will tear our house down. He'll destroy our lives. You've got to know that God made you a new creation in Christ. You're not who you used to be. So as I'm coming down the house, I see it. And what stood out, what was really different was the roof. And the Lord said, I'm putting over my church a covering such as never been in existence before. And the church will be recognized by its covering. That no weapon formed against it shall prosper. That they're under the protection of Almighty God. That they're shielded from the curse that's touching the rest of the world. And it will cause it to stand out as an example of a love story between God and His people. So then, we're taken to the next scene where they're wanting to to condemn the house again and the government's doing it. Now, what I'm pondering, I don't have full understanding of this. Maybe these two are getting something, but the government hates the oil, hates the anointing that we've sown into the ground, and they want to tear down the church. Amen? 
And uh, again, I believe it was Father God and Jesus having this discussion. And they decide to do another work to save it and to salvage the oil and to keep the house from being demolished. And I believe that may be where we're at right now because the government wants to destroy us as a church. I'm talking about the wicked government. You follow me? And uh, they decide they're not going to let it go. And when they go through the house, they're showing just how glorious it is on the inside. And I really believe that God's showing us how precious we are to him and how phenomenal this revival of love, because the end time revival is going to be a revival of love. How phenomenal it's going to be. And again, this is the first time I've told this dream without choking up. I guess it's been three weeks ago that some of the emotional effect has waned a bit. But at the time, I was covered in the love of God when I came out of that dream. And so uh, I want you to know that God considers you his precious building project. And he's purchased you with his own blood, given his life for you. That you may think things don't look that much different on the outside, but God's shifting you on the inside. And you're not who you used to be. I don't know about you, but I have people tell me all the time, I used to be about half crazy. Amen. I don't know how I got into IBM. I really don't. It had to be God. Because I wasn't the model, how can I say, industrial citizen. I was the only one around driving a Harley to work with a three-piece suit every day. <laughs> but yet, despite my past, God redeemed me. And now people from my past that maybe haven't seen me in years, haven't seen me since before I was saved or maybe I grew up with, when they meet me, they'll go, you're not the person you used to be. You're not the same. I'm not supposed to be. You're not supposed to be. God's building us from the inside out to make us habitable by his spirit and fillable with his glory. If that sentence is okay to state it like that. And you are precious to God. Don't get in agreement with condemnation and let them tear down you as the house of God. Stay focused on what God has. Amen. What's going on, Pastor Rebecca? Okay. Who wants to add to this now? I've called these up here to comment. Is this okay with you so far? I wish I could relate to you and just shift to you the emotions of the dream, the love that was in the dream. But I'm hoping you can pick it up through the narrative. Just a, a couple things. Um, you were talking about um, the room on the right, and the word that was used was I could transform that into. And, you know, we talk about... Um, going through the changes, letting the word change us. But being a new creation is a transformation. It's a completely new thing. There is no way you would ever equate what was there before with what there is now in structure, in form, in function, in any way, in value, in worth. It's completely transformed, unrecognizable from what was there before. And like what you're just saying in, in your own life, there was a complete transformation. And then um, I texted Pastor Jack uh, about a week or so ago that um, I woke up being reminded of a vision I had had about, um, and it was called The Vision, The Blueprint. Mm -hmm. And I just looked. I've got my notes back from then. It was in uh, November of 2016. and, and It's I, been that long ago. Yeah. Yeah, I, I knew it was a while ago, but I was kind of shocked it was that long ago, too. And everything he's saying about this, I kind of feel like this is this plants right inside of his dream. I'll let him determine if he thinks that's right or not. But when you were when you were talking again today, I picked up some new stuff today that within this in mind, mm -hmm. I hadn't put together. But the two nails, the apostles and the prophets. 
I believe that. Um, um, it, um, I, real briefly, I won't go into a lot of it because I don't want to let Pastor Rebecca get in. There's too much to just overtake the whole thing. But um, I saw this blueprint, and it was rolled out in front of me, and it was like a reverse image to what you would see in the world, like blueprints are. They're you know blue and white, and they're reversed, right? And I'm looking at it, and I can see it. It's real clear, and the, the detail in it was phenomenal. It was like I can still see it now in my mind's eye, but to try to describe it to you, I, I really can't because I, I saw it with, like, spiritual eyes. And it was completely and fully rolled open. This is a revelation that is out there. It's already there. It's in the Word. It's all fully revealed in, in, in terms of the ability to see it and read it and follow it. And uh, the ground had been prepared. The workers, the materials, the skills, the wisdom, everything was there. But he started to show me this. And so I started to jot down real quick in the dream. I started to jot down what I saw and how it was, was put down. But even when I started to jot it down, he had to tell me, no, I've got it in the wrong order. Because um, first, first was the cornerstone, which is obviously Jesus. We know that he's the cornerstone. Then the second, um, I had next put the foundation down, and he said, no, that's wrong. Next is the covering. And I started to ask him, well, how's the covering going to stay up? And he's already, like, way ahead of me. He's like, I uphold all things with the power of my word. Okay, got it. <laughs> you don't need walls to hold up the covering. Okay. And then the foundation was the apostles and the prophets, and it uh, said to support and serve that which is being built upon it. And a lot of scriptures for that. But... We talked about, I've framed a lot of things, those two nails, that's the apostles and the prophets. I felt like that's what that was, tying that together. Um, and just to, to briefly go on, then, then was, um, after the foundation, then was the framework. And that's the part where it says, building my church on the quarterstone. And there's a whole lot of scriptures I have to that. I won't go further into it right now. Um, but... You know, the, the, whole, the whole thing was the cornerstone, the covering, the foundation of the apostles, the prophets, the framework, like columns and pillars. And then five, the last part of it was that he was going to build a habitation and an indwelling. And there's, that's the gist of it. So, mm -hmm. um, But what you're talking about, the oil um, getting the, out of the ground, it's the hidden anointing. It's the anointing that's already been, mm -hmm. we've been saturated with, and they're trying to get control of it. I just got something else on that. Okay. Second scene with the two men trying to, you know, decide if they're going to let the house be destroyed because it was commanded by the government. I believe it was during the tribulation. And during the tribulation, because the oil was residual oil from the anointing in the area, during the tribulation, the Antichrist is going to try to wipe out any residual or, how can I say, imprint of the church during that time. And they want to wipe out anything that the church uh, has been involved in or done. And they must take out that house, the church. And if you read the, you know, the revelation, the church is targeted for totally being eliminated. And I believe that's during that time. And uh, yet inside it was still glorious. Go ahead. Well, I didn't get quite that kind of detail but um i was looking when i what i was getting was more well tell what a, happened the other day when you well i woke up um it was after you, the day after you told us i called yeah. it on monday i think it yeah. was i woke up and i had an overwhelming feeling of love how god love and i just knew this dream was how jesus loves the church jesus and the bride of christ i just i knew it and I just laid there kind of, you know, when you're half asleep, half awake. And, you know, that's probably the best time for God to talk to me because I stop thinking and talking back. OK, so um, I'm laying there and he is just speaking to me about this dream and about what he really um, uh, was trying to convey, I think, in the dream was how much he loves us. And I. Even, I had no problem with Pastor Jack being a type of Jesus and Patty being part of the bride because I've known them for a long time. So I know how they feel about each other. And that was just a perfect representation. We have that in our church. 
perfect representation of that. So later on in the day, um, I was, I've been working on a prayer assignment that God gave me. And later on in the day, somebody actually gave me a word and I'm going to read it to you. It's amplified. It's in the amplified version, Galatians 5, 7 through 10. You were running the race nobly. Who has interfered and hindered or stopped you from your heeding and following the truth? This evil persuasion is not from him who called you, who invited you to freedom in Christ. A little leaven, a slight inclination, inclination to error, or a few false teachers leavens the whole lump. It perverts the whole conception of faith and misleads the whole church. For my part, I have confidence toward you in the Lord that that you will take no contrary view of the matter, but will come to think with me. But he who is unsettling you, whoever he is, will have to bear the penalty. Now, I looked that up because what I was really getting out of the dream was that that when he got to the part where the government wanted to tear down the house, the government, it, what they're trying to do is tear down Christianity, uh, not to necessarily get away, from, you know, get rid of it, but tear it down and rebuild it up, not according to the word. And this mansion was built with the word, on the word, on the anointing is what this mansion was built. And they, um, so the government wants to tear it down and bring it up. I mean, if you want to, if you want a representation of that, look at Russia. You know, they totally tore down Christianity. Now it's rising back up. But, I mean, they built their church exactly the way the government wanted it. And that's what the government's trying to do to our church, to the church, not necessarily our church, <clears throat> to the church of God. And um, so I was actually, you know, you, people who are being misled, like in these scriptures, look at Christianity from the outside and they think, oh, that's outdated. Yeah. We don't care. You know, we need to accept homosexuality because that's the sign of the times. That's the culture. And the Bible didn't really mean that. And that's what they're saying. And they're trying to tear it down from the inside out by leavening whatever Christians will let them in to do that. And it's, so it's actually being trying to be torn down from the inside out. Well, I, I thought, what does a little leaven have to do? I'm not a baker. I, I hardly cook. Okay, I'm not a baker. So I'm like, what in the heck is leaven? Well, it's yeast because it makes bread rise and stuff like that. Well, that part I knew. And I thought, how do you counteract yeast? What counteracts that? So, you know, Google, who's the definitive authority on everything, <laughs> helped me out with that. And um, salt n negates yeast. Salt. So by the word of God, which we are the salt of the earth, the word is the salt, this yeast can be ne negated. And the inside of that mansion that looked kind of plain on the outside was being kept alive by the anointing and the word, the salt of the word. And people who would actually care to come in instead of just looking at it from the outside will see and be changed. And they will not they will, like it says here, but will come to think with me. But he who is unsettling you, whoever he is, will have to bear the penalty. And the devil's going to have to bear the penalty for trying to tear down the church. Amen. And people are going to start coming inside because, you know, God was also talking to me about gangs. I have a weird thought process. I just have to tell you that right now. But the thing about a gang, people join a gang because they want to belong. Mm -hmm. And they see these gangs that that um, where they say, oh, man, you know, they don't have a place where they can belong. They might not have the greatest family, you know, whatever. So they see these gangs and they think, man, I'll be accepted there. And, you know, and so they join the gangs. Well, you know what? We need to be the gang, actually, mm -hmm. because the Bible says that, you know, people are going to come to us and they're going to see how much we love each other, yes. not how much we love them, yes. how much we love each other. And they're going to want to come in. And that's what's going to lead them into this mansion to find the vibrancy in the inside, no matter what they think it looks like on the outside. But that's it. I think that was all I had. And the revivalists, I, I actually put down here, revivalists see the value. 
Amen. of the well, house, not just regular religious Christians, but that, revivalists see the value. That bleeds into the other point, next point I want to make. First, I'm going to read this verse just so we can keep Scripture, keep things in context. Ephesians chapter 5 says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, which is that what this was the, that's what this was about, and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. It's amazing that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle in this thing. And uh, it's amazing in this conversation about God loving the church, Christ loving the church, it refers to what he's doing on the inside. That he's cleansing it by the water of the word, removing spots and wrinkles by the spirit of God. And all of a sudden I remembered another uh, dream I had. And again, I've had Jesus visit me at least three times, twice in dreams. And in March of 2018, uh, I had a dream where Jesus came to me and showed me the churches of the world, showed me those that are going in and those that aren't. And he took me clear up into, I mean, clear into outer space, and I'm looking down the earth, and I see all the churches in the world in, in an instant. He said, this group are going to the glory, this group are not. And the group going into the glory was a lot smaller than the groups not. And he said, the churches that cannot go to the glory are those that are in competition with one another. They're implementing people-pleasing, user-friendly agendas, hyper-grace doctrines to try to draw people in and hold people through entertainment versus the word. And they're more concerned about filling buildings than they are transforming peoples. He said, the church is going to the glory Maybe small, and I saw these little bit of churches all around the world. Maybe small, but they're teaching the word and teaching people how to live by faith. Well, in an earlier part of the dream, same dream, same night at least, uh, I was in a uh, old store that lived where I grew up in Tennessee, Bunker Hill, Tennessee. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, I lived on a farm about a little over a mile from town, and our town was more like a store that at one time had, had a gas pump, but just the farm community center. <clears throat> and uh, we were out on the interstate, but we didn't, we didn't rate an exit. We could just see the trucks go by. And uh, it had a little community store that we all hung out at. I mean, it was the go play. We'd haul hay, everybody'd end up at the store. In the same store, on the same counter, they'd cut meat, make you sandwiches, and at the same time, be cutting hair on the other end of the counter. I mean, it was card games in the back, everything. And I'm in this store, and I'm the only one there. For some reason, nobody is there. It's like it's closed, and I've gotten in after hours. And I'm thirsty. I mean, I am just totally, extremely thirsty that I've got to have something to drink. And there was a cooler there, and there were all kinds. I think there was milk in there and all other kinds of things. But there was a shelf there right up at this level. kind of had to get up to look at it, full of soft drinks. And I said, I'll get me a soft drink. And there's Coca-Colas all through there. I mean, just Cokes everywhere. And I'm going, Coke, that sounds good. I could drink a Coke. And as I'm about to grab one, I realize everybody drinks Coke. I don't want a Coke. And I keep looking, and I find an RC Cola. Easy on the syrup, easy on the gas. Amen. <laughs> I'm sorry. I have these connectors, right? I find an RC Cola. I think I'm going to drink an RC. So I take the RC, and uh, then it shifts to another part of the dream. And so again, this has been two years ago, a little over two, I called these guys in here, and I said, here's what God showed me in a dream. And Pastor Nancy interprets it like that. She says, RC stands for royal crown. And she says, the Lord says, that you've rejected the way everyone else goes and you're choosing the royal crown direction. You're choosing the anointing. You're not doing it. You're not building the church your own way or through you know normal patterns. You're doing it how God says. And that's when then I saw the churches of the world. And so what God was saying in the dream is, you're doing it how I've told you. And uh, But many are not. And the point, how I want to tie this to the dream is, again, the house looked plain on the outside. I mean, it 
it was big, but it wasn't like, oh, that's a man. I didn't look at the house and think that's a mansion. I thought it was just huge. Mansions have big columns and fountains and hedges all around. Didn't have any of that. It had some big trees out front, uh, which weren't there originally. I just realized that. It was long enough in the future that the house I saw was in a field with no trees around it. But when I see it the final time, it's got like huge oak trees around it. So it's been a long time for that to happen. Trees of righteousness and filled with people. So, again, to go where God wants us in the end times, you've got to be willing not to look, go the common route every other Christian is choosing. Well, that's a big church. It must be safe. That must be where God's moving. But you go when they're not, nobody's getting healed, delivered. There's no anointing on the place to speak of. It's just a nice entertainment venue where people feel like they're doing their duty to God. And God says, I'm not bringing the glory to that. I'm bringing the glory to the place that's not concerned about what they look like to others. They're only concerned about what they look like to God. And it's not going to look like the most attractive, how can I say, outward place around. No flashing lights, none of that. It's just going to be word. And uh, people have to be willing. If they're going to be part of the process of being in the house, they've got to be willing to ignore the outside and target what's going on in the inside. Amen? Now, I expect to have nice-looking buildings. I expect for us to have a huge, huge built church. But I can't, I cannot target that and leave the word development process behind because that's my assignment. Amen. Ephesians chapter 4, he gave some apostles, prophets, pastors, evangelists, and teachers for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. And then it goes on to about the glory of God coming on that, that people. And that's our job. Go ahead. Well, you know, you I saw, an, I had another vision that went along with it, and I saw someone consuming the word. They were like putting the pages into their mouth as fast as they could. I mean, they were just like, you know, just consuming it. And I wrote down at this time also that there was a uh, time of intense preparation of the word coming, um, that through prayer we were going to speak the purposes, and um, the results of these would come, and we would call in the resources like making withdrawal. Um, Binding and loosing, transferring what we see in heaven to earth by our decrees, which is what you know has been being taught. But then he he said that faith is going to be the footers that we have to drive them deep. Um, and then he took me back to your other vision you had that's on. I guess it's not there anymore. The the vision of the the water tower. How this is it back now? You got the new one. Okay, great. Um, that's how observant I am. Uh, <laughs> but that you sing in the spirit. Yeah. So it's um, tying back to that, the intercession. But the whole thing, this whole blueprint, everything was brought down to the last thing. And the last thing that I had on this was that it's like a stage is being set to display his glory. The whole purpose of this whole thing, that's what it all was coming down to. He was setting the stage. He's laid the plans. He's making the provision. His heart's desire, the vision that's picked up and carried forth. Mm -hmm. And then changing us internally into the new creation of what he has, and then us operating in that, um, it's it's phenomenal. It's we are right there. Mm -hmm. I have a I have a question for you before you go. We have a binder in the back of prophecies that we brought forth in here over several years. That if you'll sit and read it, you'll be amazed at what God's been telling and how they all tie together. But I want to ask you: Do we have those on electronic? Uh, yeah, they're all online on our website. The whole thing is okay. Everything. So if you go to our website, you can go to our prophecies section. And, uh, <clears throat> yeah, it's underneath virtual church called prophetic words. And virtual everything. church, prophetic words. It's all words. by month, and it's all who's done it. And you can go on and read about what yeah. God's speaking to us for years Yeah, through all uh, out these there. prophecies. Mm -hmm. So go ahead. Amen. Well, you know, I was just thinking about the trees that you saw when you were coming up. I don't know that it was so much the passage of time that made them grow big, but the oil in the ground. Oh. Ah, that's good. You know, the oil hang on, hang on, hang on. Ephesians chapter 3 says, talking about trees, we are rooted and grounded exactly. in love. Right. So I don't know. I, Ooh, I, saw, I like that. I like that. 
I can't say how the passage of time, but I know mm -hmm. that that's what's making the trees grow. The love is, see, for us as trees are righteous, we grow by love. Right. We pull it in, we process it, and produce outwardly to the world the fruit of the Spirit. Yeah. Well, and I was getting mature, not time, but yeah. mature. Right. Amen. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing I want to go to that ties us together, uh, our verse over here, Habakkuk 2.14, for the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as waters cover the sea. Talks about God's end time vision. And Habakkuk 2.2 2 says to Habakkuk, God says, write this vision, make it plain upon tables, that they may run that readeth it. So God said, everybody with a Bible that has Habakkuk in it, which hopefully you do, he says, when you read about the glory coming to the earth, that's your assignment to run towards. But in verse 4, Habakkuk 2.4, he tells the people of the glory. He says in verse 4, Behold, he whose soul is lifted up is not upright in him. Now, it says your soul's lifted up. What's that mean? It means you, your soul is your mind, will, and emotions. He says it's that people that have elevated what they think above God's word, they're not going to the glory. They're not right. Now, get this. Here's what's interesting. God said, I've elevated my word above my name. Somebody whose soul's lifted up has elevated their soul above the word. Right. So wow. what they've done is a hierarchy is supposed to be the word, God, us, but instead they've went them, the word, God, because God's put himself under the word. And uh, God says they can't go to the glory. But then it says, but the just shall live by his faith. The righteous just means righteous. The righteous shall live by faith. And that's the building process is to build a revelation of how the kingdom of God functions, how we can activate the principles of the kingdom and, and access the power of God through faith to display to the earth the real reality of the oil. Well, in that covering, that order you said, the word Jesus, that, you know, mm -hmm. that whole thing, if they're out of that order, they're out of the covering. Oh, yeah. So that yeah, whole covering right. yeah. is they're, they're outside it. Yeah. The good news is the house is full of people under covering. And even though uh, I was gone in this case, Jesus, well, of course, he's been dead 2,000 years, but the house was packed full of people having the best time of their life, which is like the motorboat vision. Praise God. So I'm excited about where we're going. Again, I don't know. I believe God's going to continue to speak to us out of this dream. And it's not that I'm looking to have dreams to have something to preach. But this was so moving to me, I wanted to share it this morning. And uh, yes. Do you remember a while back you had a revelation from God and he like gave you parts of it and then you couldn't remember it? Yeah. And then there was more. He, and he's yeah. done this a few times now. And I mm -hmm. feel like this is the next installment Could be. in what he's laying out for you. Yeah to lead us into yeah. and and it's getting more and more detailed and more and more released in terms of direction as we get to the point where we need to actually move on it but i think this is like another another installment of it good i believe that back in 1991 i'd come off of a fairly long fast and had four dreams in four nights each dream was three parts so I got up and I wrote down the first night, two in the morning. I've got it in my desk in here. Wrote down the dream, all the details of it. Woke up next night, another dream, two in the morning again, wrote down all the details. The third night, I said, I'm so tired. Let me just lay here a minute. And I woke up the next day, couldn't remember it. So then the fourth night, I think I had the third dream again. This time I got up and wrote it down. So it's really three dreams in over four nights. Each dream, three parts. And in the primary dream, really the main one, it was where Jesus visited me. He came to me in the dream. And he took me. It was almost, remember Willie Wonka where they go up in the eleva elevator? The end of Will it was like that. But it was Jesus, I wasn't in the elevator. He just kind of grabbed me and lifted me up. And we went clear to the edge of heaven. I didn't go in. I just went to the edge. And he showed me the future. And he showed me a future that was so glorious, what he was going to do in the earth, that it was beyond imagination. It was so phenomenal that I was left awe, awestruck. 
And with it came this emotional release of, I've never felt like this in my life. In fact, there was such an anointing on the dream that in the dream, I knew I'd never felt that good on earth at any time in my life. Never. Not even close. I felt totally euphoric. No fear, no concern, no weight, just totally liberated in the dream. And so he showed me all these events he was going to do in the earth. And it was it was unspeakable glorious. And then he says, now I'm sending you back. And I'm not going to let you retain the memory of what I just showed you. I'm taking away all the memory of what I just showed you. And I'm only going to leave you with the feeling and the knowledge of how awesome it was. And I woke up with that revelation of just how euphoric and how phenomenal it is going to be in the end times. How the glory is going to be for us. And uh, I knew why he, to some level, why he couldn't show it to me. Because if God showed it to me, I'd try to make it happen. And uh, get frustrated when it, went on my, when, it went, when it wasn't on my schedule. But God's bringing a move that's unspeakable glorious. Now, again, I got caught up in the glory. I've been caught up in the glory several times over the years. It's now been probably, I think it was about 2002, that I got caught up in God's glory for almost two weeks. And to explain what it was for two weeks... I'm caught up with God. I can't, I can't get upset. I can't get oppressed. I have nothing but just phenomenal joy and peace. Uh, everybody I prayed for got healed. Faith was automatic. You know, I say often in here, the glory fixes everything. It fixed everything. I just loved everybody unconditionally. And those that know me, Wayne can attest to that probably, uh, when I'm on the motorcycle or in a car, I'm rarely going slow. I tend to get from one point to another at the maximum rate I can without getting a ticket or being too much in violation of speed laws. And so uh, I'm always doing something. I don't sit around well at all. I've got to be working on something. I have trouble taking days off because I'm not programmed just to sit. And uh, I'm sure Patty would tell you that. I usually sit down about 10 at night, 9 to 10, 9 at the earliest, 10 or 11 from doing stuff. So I never drive below the speed limit. The speed limit is like the starting place. And as quick as I can get there, the better. That's why I like acceleration. There's no substitute for acceleration. Whoa! But under the glory, I couldn't do the speed limit. I would be going down the, down the main street in Frankfurt. Speed limit 50. I'm doing 30. People are honking their horns, you know, zipping around me and everything. I'm going, bless them, God. Thank you, Jesus. I couldn't. I, just, like, I was just caught up with God, and I was oblivious. I was more aware of the Spirit than I was the natural. And uh, what are you laughing about? <laughs> because I was listening to Apostle Callahan last night, and he was talking about when his cat's life set of things on fire. Say he again. was. I was listening to Apostle Callahan because he, you know, he. I, I go to sleep with him on because he's. No, wait, so, wait, 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 wait. Okay. <laughs> I, had to, I got you. Yeah. Um, anyway, I was listening to him tonight. He was talking about, last night, and he was talking about casting out demons. And he said that um, they, he had cast out this one demon where the lady knew sign language with one of the demons that was in her. Was and there. that she only, were you there? I was there. And he, he, said, he said, that one only gave me one sign. <laughs> <laughs> I was there. And it wasn't one I can repeat. That's what he said. And when you said that, I'm thinking, yeah, you got one sign, didn't you? That was <laughs> in Kansas. As people were going 30. Was it, where it, was it was in Kansas, yeah. and one of the demons only spoke French. Yeah, that was yeah. That's what he was talking about. Yeah, I was there going. But anyway, I was just thinking when you said people are going around you honking yeah. and everything, I'm thinking, yeah, he got the one sign too. <laughs> yeah, I did, I'm sure. But what was what was wild was, I couldn't. I'm pretty good with numbers. I couldn't. I couldn't balance a checkbook. I couldn't add numbers in my head. I was so caught up in the spirit, I couldn't do normal natural things. 
I, I don't think I could work on anything. I couldn't take anything apart, put it back together. It's like, what's this? Bless you, Lord. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I couldn't focus on the natural. And God made me aware that in the glory, you just don't step in and you function at a high level. you got to learn how to transition from living in the natural to living in the glory. Because it's so radically different. And your mind works so much differently that uh, it's a quantum shift. And what you used to be good at, you may not be good at in the glory. Well, I kind of talked a few times about having like a parallel, almost like an awareness of the spiritual realm and then the natural realm and, and trying to work in both of them too. And I think I could still, I wasn't trying to do anything as finite as like you were talking about. I was thinking I was trying to, to walk <laughs> and maybe interact with somebody. And I, I saw like two images, the same image. And I saw them like split apart. And I realized I was in the upper um, version of it. And then the natural was the lower version of it. And so I'm functioning from this one, still doing things in it. But the awareness I had was my position. My awareness was different of who I was, why I was, what I could do, what my authority was, the position of how I was interacting as we're seated in heavenly places. That's what I began to. And this was just an entry level. And I, I, I got into it and then kind of like faded back out of it. I didn't learn how to stay in it. But I think this is something we're going to start to experience more and more. Those glimpses and those glimpses mm -hmm. will get longer. And then, and then we learn to, like, you just, you were just full in. You were mm -hmm. immersed in it. But, you know, I think that's what we're going to start to experience on the way to that. Because it's, it's not like, you know, the Bible says we go from glory to glory. And so it's not like we're here one day, all of a sudden, yeah. switch is flipped, and now you're yeah. in this full experience of it like pastor jack experienced in fact in fact when it lifted i was devastated i'll bet and i said god what did i do to lose it what did I, how did i mess up why did i lose it and he said to me so clearly he says you didn't lose it i was giving you a taste of what's to come that i'm bringing to the church in the end times and uh because he wanted me to taste it so i could tell people about it it's kind of like you had that dessert someplace you go say Go to that restaurant, that silk pie or whatever is, you know, phenomenal. Mine, I tell people, look, Culver's, go to Culver's and get a butterscotch concrete. <laughs> Amen. But anyway, I'm telling you the glory is coming and we can't comprehend how great it is. Anything else? Just stay in the word because that's what builds the house. That's right. Just stay in the word. Stay in the word, stay in prayer, stay in church. Exactly. That was what the vision was, was of the mm -hmm. sword of the spirit, the word of God, and mm -hmm. then the word earlier this morning. So it's, it's all lined up without having any knowledge if that's what. Amen. Yeah. Right now, I've had, I've had so many dreams and visions, you know, the motorboat, the railroad tracks, the water tower we could go into just to tell you how these all interconnect, they tie. And back last year, God said, I want you to write down, make a list of the major dreams and visions I've given you, the visitations, write them down. So I started making a list of all these. I mean, I was going through notes that had run across visions and dreams I'd had. I'd forgotten about, but I wrote down the major ones. And over 36 years, every single one I had dealt with the glory. Every one dealt with the glory of God coming. That's kind of interesting because every one that I've ever had dealt with the word. So, mm. and when you're talking about your railroad tracks, I I don't have very many visions or dreams or anything like that. So, I don't have to write them down. I just think I can think of them all in one hand. But um, after he had the vision of the railroad tracks, we were in all night prayer one night, and I actually had a vision of. Being on the railroad tracks, and you know, in those old um, Casey, we'll get the t shirt out of my office. You know, those old um, uh, western movies where the trains are going and then they have to stop occasionally, and they would stop underneath this thing and pull the thing and it, you know, pull the rope and it would fill, fill it up with coal so that it can fuel them. And I that was my vision that we were on the railroad tracks and we would come to these places to where we would stop and refuel. 
and we'd pull those things and mm -hmm. and and keep going on the railroad tracks. We weren't getting off the tracks. We didn't have to stop. We just stopped long enough to refuel. And that was, I mean, the word. And that's the word. About 10 years ago, we were doing an all-night prayer. I feel like I need to share this. It's been probably more. We were doing an all-night prayer on a Friday night. And we were at a section where we, I'd had everybody bring up chairs and an oval here. And... Uh, one lady, I'm sitting here, one lady's over to my left, just praying, and all of a sudden had a vision open up while she's talking. And I saw from my feet going right down this center aisle, like it is now, a set of railroad tracks. It went clear down the center aisle, out the back wall, into the parking lot, and I'm talking about like the first or second line of cars, there was a cloud of pure white glowing glory so dense if you put your hand into it you couldn't see your fingertips just dense glory and the tracks went right into it and the lord said to me just so clear you're on track to go into the glory don't get distracted detracted and all of a sudden off to the sides like a mile away i saw these little fires bonfires going and god said don't look at those stay focused on the glory well here we are how many there's fires burning all over the nation God's saying, don't look at that. Keep focused on the glory. Well, at that time, we were doing concerts every Friday night. And uh, we were bringing bands in from all around the country. And the next and normally I was here, but this next Friday, I wasn't uh, here for the concert. Pastor Rebecca was. She's orchestrating. And it was a band came in called The Apprentice. We brought in Christian bands, not just any bands, Christian bands. And... Uh, the apprentice and they had their own merchandise table and she saw their she saw their t-shirt and she recognized her from the vision I had and it's a set of railroad tracks going straight down the center of the shirt a week later this is in our place so she snagged one I've had it on my wall in my office ever since to keep me reminded to look at the glory now what's interesting is the next Friday night after the t-shirt when her praying and I'm praying, and I'm walking around here, and I get back to the back where the camera is, that area, and I look, and there's gold dust on me. That gold gold dust was manifesting, and God's saying, I'm bringing this glory. Don't get distracted. Well, now we're in the time of the distractions. Keep your focus, keep yourself focused on the building project, and you are that project. Uh, we really run out of time today. I feel like we could do this all day. Well, let's do this. I want every head bowed, every eye closed.